And for some people, being older, just just the simple fact of having more years on the planet. Absolutely. That stepping into that responsibility that is inherent to marriage and the commitment therein is easier for some people if they're a bit older. Yeah. Some 22 year olds are not ready to make those choices. They may want to because, oh, I'm in love and it seems like it's the time or maybe there's pressure from the families or maybe there's pressure from the fiance but they're not quite ready to do this. So that kind of gets to maybe prong number one, no matter what age you are, you have to ask yourself, are you ready to be the adult that marriage requires? All right, Elliot, it is the long <laughs> promise. <Finally here. laughs> we have threatened to do this topic for a long, long time. I mean, probably over a year or two, which is, um, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not, proud of us for taking this long, but we had other topics that were mm -hmm. on the, the front burner and this one got to the back burner, but today we're ready to rumble. <laughs> 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 we're going to do the debate topic is, is it better to marry earlier or later? And we'll bring in some research and certainly a ton of clinical experience from the couples Elliot's worked with. And then of course our own experiences as that, that personal perspective, Elliot having married when he was like a week into age 22 and me having married, well, that's interesting. Now that I think about it, 20 years later, yep, 42. <laughs> 42. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. So Elliot, do you want to start? Do you want to? Well, I think foundationally we both agree on this. The right person makes the right time way more than the other way around. So just yeah. saying, I want to be married at 22, I never said that. I did say I want to be married young, mm -hmm. but I never said I want to be married by 22 and then just grab the first woman that was close enough that was interested, mm -hmm. right? And I'd had, I was a long-term dater. I was not a short-term dater. So I'd had a couple long relationships. Both quality women just weren't the right match for me, both doing well now in their own matches. So that's awesome. Uh, but once I connected with Angie, and she was older, a couple years older, which makes a difference. If she'd also been 21, I don't think we'd have probably married that quickly, but because she's already established two years into her teaching career, the youngness of it never bothered me or never made me question. I mean, it's not my nature anyway. But being the first one to marry out of all your friend groups, both out of Ohio and Illinois, that was interesting because that would raise up some conversations. And then dad did talk to me about it when we went and sat down at the Acropolis and had a lunch and talked through it. And and he was very much in favor of it. He just didn't want me, um, I can't remember the exact words he used, but it was pretty funny. Just didn't want me to be naive and stupid or something. He said, <laughs> just being very direct about, yeah. hey, you got a great woman. We believe in her. We think she's awesome for you. In fact, you know, he'd say stuff like, we think she's actually quite a bit ahead of the game than you are. You know, just being very upfront about maturity and yeah, I was candid. yeah, and career and all that. And I said, yeah, I get it totally. And and then just tell me, you know, basically a manhood conversation about well, once that rings on the finger and you say I do, you know, no more seven sports leagues, no more this right. You gotta you gotta get your degree that you're going after. You know, counseling was hard for him to consider. That wasn't the easiest, you know, profession for me to tell him I wanted to be in. And um, that he's generation like, you, didn't do a yeah. lot of that. That was certainly for men, especially. Yeah. So that was a little difficult for him either mm -hmm. also, but he's saying a lot of that. So yeah, you're going to go to full-time school, which is great. You know, we're proud of you for doing that academically after the hard times I'd had, but it was really a really strong message of man up. And I don't care if you're going to school full-time, you start part-time work doing something, drumming, coaching, you know, lawn work, painting something. And I did all those things. Mm -hmm. And so again, if it wasn't Angie or wasn't the right woman, the right time. And not that Angie and I didn't have a ton of growing to do. We did, but I just want to throw that essence out. The right person sometimes makes the time rather than vice versa. We are thrilled to announce our partnership with Authentics Athletic Apparel, spelled with two X's at the end because it's our XX chromosomes that make us female. And contrary to current belief, no amount of hormones, no number of surgeries can change that. 
and no female athlete should have to compete against men. But at the moment, this is exactly what's happening in both amateur and professional sports. It's not fair, nor is it safe. Wearing Authentics lets us take a stand to support and protect female athletes. And I don't think it's hyperbolic to say it, we're protecting the future of womanhood. Authentics gives 10% of all sales to the Independent Women's Forum, the nonprofit which fights for women's causes, including our right to our own spaces and our right to compete against other women and only other women. Check out Authentics.com and use promo code LOVELIFE for 10% off your purchase. That's Authentics.com, A-U-T-H-E-N-T-I-X-X.com and use promo code LOVELIFE, all one word, for 10% off your purchase. Just another bit of dad's history. He had, he really reached a crossroads when he went, met mom and he was older because he'd been in the army, he was drafted in the Korean war, came back to finish up his degree. He had a degree already in accounting, I believe. And then he came back to get the music degree. And that's when he met mom. And right before he decided to propose, he was invited to tour Europe with a jazz group. And as a jazz musician, that's pretty much your dream, dream is yeah. to, yeah, to go on the road with the band. And he must have had some deep talks within himself and said, and no, his I'm mentor. 27. Yeah. Who, his mentor? And Simon Says, his mentor at uh, Stevens Point. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's some of that history's in Simon Says, if anybody wants to go online and yeah. look at the site and buy that book. But yeah, you're right on, spot on all of that, of course. But um, I didn't recognize the influence of his mentor until mom shared it more with me. Mm, okay. But the mentor was saying things like he ended up saying to me, like, listen, this is a quality woman, and if this is really what you want, mm -hmm. you want to you want to be an established man right. and husband and future teacher, or whatever. You put the you put the plane away. You do it on the side still, but you don't do both. You don't say, oh yeah, Nancy, I'm committed to you, and then you go overseas for two years. Right, and so what he had to do was man up, and of course, in his era, and I think we would also support this as looking at the roles that we believe are healthiest and research shows as well that traditional marriages do very well typically. And that doesn't mean that people with unconventional marriages can't be happy, but getting back to the traditional role that dad stepped into, I'm not going to go tour Europe and run around with these jazz musicians and have a, a big party, which was an option. He made a different choice, which is now that I am going to marry this one woman, I'm going to provide for her. I'm going to protect her. And he was, I guess, saying something similar to you that now you, yeah, you're yeah. the student, Angie has a full-time job, but you still need to be providing in some way, shape, or form, which you yeah, did. Yeah, like, like he did. Also, he went to Ann Arbor to get his master's and doctorate in music ed, even though he already had a master's or at least a bunch of extra classes. And so, yeah, there were some similarities, though he was older. He was near Warren's age at marriage, 27 or so, 28. Um, for dad, 27, I can't remember exact age for Warren, but... And so, so I think for you, again, when saying, okay, then Karen gets married at 42, does that mean there was never the exact right guy? And we could debate that, whether there was potentially right guys, but different things happened or different scenarios. But because we were saying time, I'm saying person above time. And yeah, so, yeah. And but I, the, also the theme that is emerging here is that once you make that decision, there's an element of you got to grow up. Yeah, all, some sacrifice, some alterations, right. some adjustments. And for some people, being older, just just the simple fact of having more years on the planet. Absolutely. That stepping into that responsibility that is inherent to marriage and the commitment therein is easier for some people if they're a bit older. Yeah. Some 22-year-olds are not ready to make those choices. They may want to because, oh, I'm in love and it seems like it's the time or maybe there's pressure from the families or maybe there's pressure from the fiance, but they're not quite ready to do this. So that kind of gets to maybe prong number one. No matter what age you are, you have to ask yourself, are you ready to be the adult that marriage requires? To use the term that they say nowadays, you know, it's adulting. Yeah. So <laughs> marriage necessitates adulting. And you decided you were ready. And you stepped into that in the fullness of that role. A lot of 22-year-olds wouldn't be. 
Now, as someone who was single for so long, the flip side of that, and I'm just going to speak out uh, a little shout out to my single peeps out there, just because you haven't had the opportunity or to your point a moment ago, did I, I mean, I had plenty of opportunities to call it off a wedding. I'm not trying to say I had plenty of opportunities. That sounds like a little bit like, well, I had lots of offers. I'm not trying to say that. Yeah. But the point is when you're in these long-term committed relationships, there's certainly the potential mm -hmm. for these to move to marriage. If you don't get married by a certain age, then people can oftentimes look at you as if you are irresponsible, which mm -hmm. is a little bit of the- Reverse there discrimination that singles mm -hmm. can experience. And I don't think that's fair either. No. Because I think it is actually quite responsible not to just marry because it's the natural next step or everyone expects us to, or I'm feeling pressured, or I'm afraid that if I don't marry this person, no one else will ever propose to me and I'll never have the chance to be married. So there's, it's just so yes. nuanced, especially for me and having done the work I've done with single ladies for the last several years, having written the book I've written, I, I do kind of bristle. I agree we need maturity to get married and to have mm -hmm. a successful marriage. Also, if you haven't married at a certain age, doesn't mean you're immature. Yeah. In fact, I've found more immature married people than immature single people, at least in my counseling experience, because <laughs> well, that codependency factor and some of the other things that comes wrapping in. And another irony, um, Karen, you'll love this on the research side. Um, Tim and I were setting up, let's rephrase that. Tim was setting up, I was eating lunch and, uh, and Dr. Curry walked by my colleague and, um, he said, what's the topic today? You know, when we told him what we we're doing and we said early marriage versus post-marriage, he immediately went into research just like you would. Oh, good. He's like, well, I think I recall, Elliot, that marriage is before the age of 20. If you get married before the age of 20, the divorce rate skyrockets mm -hmm. um, because the lack of identity, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then I was telling him, yes, and most research says if you get married after 28, after 30, the divorce rate plummets. Yeah. So there seems to be that window, even though... Again, thanks to the generations book, you know, the average age of marriage, like when mom and dad were young, was like literally 19. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing what the statistics are. You think, oh, in the 1950s, people get married at 25. No, they were literally 19.6 or something. And now for the first time ever in the generations books, her research just said men are now averaging age 30. Yeah. So that shift in the culture yep. is enormous. And now you and I are saying loosely, and I know you'll give more research in a minute, you and I are saying loosely pre-20 dangerous, even though that's what they used to do. Yeah. And saying post-30 better. So are we saying that in this case, the generations that are choosing to get married later are going to be healthier, wiser, and happier? And I say potentially yes. Doesn't mean it's automatically, but I think mm -hmm. that statistic, though that alters a lot of things about amount of children, Mm -hmm. um, career choices, a lot of that gets altered when you're single for those 10 years. But I think the statistics and the research are going to help and the divorce rates are lowering. They are slowly diminishing and that I think is a positive factor. Right, and it speaks to what you were kind of hinting at, just identity development, knowing who you are, something we talk about pretty much every episode, having a strong sense of your core values so that you know who will be a solid fit for you, a solid partner, one that you can go the distance with in an easier marriage. I love to use that word. I know that's, mm -hmm. I can- It's not my favorite. I like it. <laughs> uh, so that's Spoken by a panda bear. Well, anyway, that's conflict styles. That's another- A strong episode. marriage. A strong marriage. Not an um, easy one. So I do want to share a little bit more research on that. To your point, this is from my book, Single is the New Black. Don't wear white till it's right. So economist Dana Rotz has found that for every year that a woman waits to marry, she lowers her risk of divorce. Hmm. So this even goes further mm -hmm. than post 30, like you were saying. Yeah. Her research shows that specifically for women who marry for the first time between the ages of 35 and 39, they are 46% less likely to divorce yeah. than women who marry between 23 and 26 which probably would not be true for mom and dad's generation, as you right. spoke to a moment ago. Yeah, but saying, with yeah. this generation, where we have perhaps even different expectations for marriage itself, mm -hmm. and where we have a different expectations, we're, we're elongating adolescence to a degree. Yeah, and there's absolutely. research that you and I have talked about a bit that as a developmental psychologist, I looked into extensively that we are creating, a, a, there's a, a researcher who talks about emerging adulthood after mm -hmm after late adolescence and early adulthood, then there's emerging adulthood, or maybe it's emerging and then early adulthood, either which way. Not really expecting people to grow up 
getting back to the point we mm-hmm. initially made, not really expecting them to take on that kind of responsibility. Even the term adulting we mentioned a moment ago. Why is that a word? Mm-hmm. Words appear in our vernacular because there's a notion that needs to be concretized with a label, a term. Mm-hmm. And because this generation, millennials, I'd say we'd started with them, are taking a little bit long, longer to grow up, then they talk about this adulting verb, not a noun. And so this speaks to the fact that some of this research I'm citing here probably would not have been true, getting back to Dr. Gene Twenge's book, Generations, you're talking about, in even our parents' generation, mm-hmm. or even probably our generation. But millennials, Gen Z, this is the case. So so again, so 35 to 39, if that's the age of your first marriage, you're 46% less likely to divorce than those women who marry between the ages of 23 and 26. She did not have enough data to continue this to see if even past 39, that those marriages, like someone like me at 42, would be less likely to divorce. But her guess is that that yeah. trend would continue. All that to say, I, I shared that in my book because it was for my, my single girl's who were walking the journey that was similar to my path, mm-hmm. who at 39, like me, after calling off a wedding and then having another heartbreak myself where falling in love and having it not work out and now facing 40 and going, is this ever going to happen? Mm-hmm. And if it does happen, oh my gosh, what kind of marriage is this going to be? It's nothing like I anticipated or, or dreamed of having as a young girl. That kind of research really comforted me sure, you know of i have a good chance still yeah. of getting something really solid may, maybe a better chance <laughs> yeah and so yeah. i shared that not to be combative even like with what you're talking about because we don't want this to be a early versus i mean we want to yeah. spar a little For bit fun, yeah. fun but we want everyone to have a great marriage no matter when it happens and that kind of research was encouraging to me and i wanted to share that with my my readers yeah and i think you and i would say if we're going to strongly exhort a warning it would way way focus on if you're under 21 than if you're 41. Yeah. Yeah, right. We're going to say, and in fact, I was just going through my head. I'm sorry. I was with you, but I was kind of spacing a little bit. That seems normal. Yeah, it is a little normal, but you got very passionate. And then I'm like, she's on a good run. I'm going to think about something. And so I was doing a quick Rolodex of all my premarital couples, which is now like 190 or something. I'm almost at 200. By next summer, I'll have 200. I I believe it. That's really cool. But I was doing a quick Rolodex and I'm thinking all those who married young and are still doing really well, you know, there's only been like six divorces out of all those couples because I keep track, you know, my old statistics thing. Yeah. It's not a spreadsheet, it's a Word doc. So I know people be like, why in the world is it I, on Word doc? That's just because I someone to throw that into an Excel. I know, it's just all I know how to do. So anyway, it's on a Word doc. But if I go through those, like part of the reason I think Angie and I made it, even though we've been on air and said before, it was a rough start. Right, we are two really independent, cantankerous at times, argumentative at times, and strong-willed, passionate people who lead differently. Right, and so yes, we had a strong love and a strong connection, and and values were all lined up, and all those things were lined up. But there were things that we missed in preparation. And so, what's one of the things I would say then, based on all my couples and my own marriage? Why did we make it, and why did we become a strong? although not easy marriage, is because both our parents had a 50-plus year marriage and worked through very difficult times. Um, And I think that makes an enormous difference. And I bet if I went back and looked through that document that should be on a spreadsheet, I will find more often than not the modeling, the environment, the protection of that family of origin systemic is hugely important. And I wonder if, I'm no, I don't even have to wonder. If Angie was from a broken home or a home that had been really difficult and abusive and things, even though her dad was an alcoholic till she was like nine until uh, the Lord healed it and he surrendered his life to Christ, um, there's no way mom and dad would have blessed that if, if Bob and Susie weren't married and intact. I, I just can't, I'm not saying they, would have, they know me well enough. If they told me I couldn't, they know it would have driven me more. Right. But I'm guaranteeing you they wouldn't have been as excited, even though Angie was such a quality, you know, young teacher with the kind of same values and system as mom and all that. So anyway, it's just interesting dynamic to throw in there is that our family of origin, since again, I'm, my counseling background is all family systems theory, and you did a lot of work in that, your whole graduate work, your doctoral dissertations in individuation. Right. So if someone has individuated and is individuating from a strong, connected 
value laden, successful marriage, easy or strong. Um, I think the opportunity then to create one, whether you're 21 or 41, is much, much higher. You're not working from a deficit or from what I hear from my clients all the time. I, I have no idea how to be a good husband. I never saw it at home. I never saw it with my uncle. I never saw it anywhere. Well, it also speaks to someone who might be trying to escape a family of origin that has a lot of chaos and dysfunction and sadness and and dissension and create a new family, which is an yes. understandable and noble goal. But if you're doing that very young, you may not have the tools yet. Yes. Or be aware, even because it helps to be aware. Even if you're right. still choosing, it's still better to be aware. Oh, this is partly why I feel an obsessive need to do this now. Right. Yeah, and, to build the new roots. And yeah, and I don't have the stats in front of me, but I mean, I'm sure there is research to suggest. I'm pre I mean, I, I feel like I've come across it, but I don't want. I don't have my finger on a study. Are children of divorce more likely to divorce themselves? Yes, I mean, for I, sure. Yeah, and the stats are really clear. Yep. We can find a study, I'm sure, yeah. just to make sure that we're saying the true truth there. And doesn't mean that if your fiance or your the someone you're dating comes from a divorced home that, that you're doomed. No. But it, to your point, you made a moment ago, has the has the model of sticking with it, mm -hmm. persevering, going through those rough times. And you mentioned Bob's alcoholism. Let's not forget. Susie was pregnant <laughs> accidentally at 16. That's so, right, yeah. Kicked that, I mean, kicked that out of high school the whole nine, yeah. Hey, yeah, because mm. that was the day when you didn't get pregnant at 16 and think your life land, was going to be fine. Farmland Iowa in the 60s. There was no right. <laughs> right, rights for the young woman there. So, again, yeah, they've had, been through their struggles, foundation yeah. was mm -hmm. just by, by virtue of the circumstances quite tenuous. Hey, Elliot, I want to show you what I just got from one of our sponsors, The Wellness Company. It is the medical emergency kit. So this has things that you might need if some other kind of pandemic situation happens. There is a guidebook inside to show you how to use and appropriate dosages. And also just because some of these medications were not readily available during mm -hmm. the last pandemic. So you wanna have them on hand for yourself. There's also antibiotics. There's ivermectin, which is one of the ones I'm unscrewing it here. Isn't there a Z-Pack in there as well? There is a Z-Pack, yeah. I've, I've listened to the commercial. Oh, you have. Thank you. I think you do a great job in commercials, so I like to hear you. Oh, well, well, I have some experience it with it. reminds me when we were little, when we when practiced. We, yeah, we were always holding up the shampoo bottle and being like, use this. So yeah, so we've got, um, we've got some really great medications that you would need. Should something happen again, you do not want to be the one who's like, I can't get what I need to keep mm -hmm. my family and my myself healthy. So it's the Wellness Company's Medical Emergency Kit and you can get it. Go to twc.health slash love life. And that's all one word, L-O-V-E-L-I-F-E. -E, and use that promo code, love life. You will save 15% off. And we thank the wellness company not only for sponsoring us, but more importantly, bringing truth about holistic medicine and care to the world. To move forward here a little bit and get direction and, and connection back and forth here, when I was thinking through this this morning, since I texted you guys, said, hey, let's do this one finally. <laughs> um, and I jotted some stuff down. When I was thinking about the top three reasons that, in my own experience as a person and as a therapist, make early marriage strong or, or good, they're also easily the three that you could say are the weaknesses. And so, I'll, I'll just throw one of them out at a time here and see if we get through them all or we end up with seven episodes here. <laughs> so, the, the first one is that identity piece, and I know you and I could debate this one probably the most intensely. I do think there's value, even if you're individuating from a good family, a positive family, one that's been stable. We all, families got their issues, people, so please don't think that we think our family was perfect or anyone else's is. All kinds of stuff that floats in and out of families. So, I'm just saying it's strong, meaning it feels secure, it feels stable, it feels effective and affirming and you feel peace and strength and hope out of your family. That's all I mean by that. So, your identity, you know, especially for the male brain, which we know now does not finish forming till 25. Mm -hmm. So, I'm married at 21, almost 22, or 22, almost 21. And others, people who get married young then, men in particular, we're not even done forming our own brain, let alone our identity completely. I think the research I saw was 
women are done at about 25. You guys aren't quite uh, solidified oh. neuro- neurologically more, speaking until like 28. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us may be 48. And I might be still getting there. But my point being that, yes, that may just, makes it a little more risky because you can have that thing where I got married at 21 and then at 29, I'm like, I'm, I'm a totally different person than I was. I don't even like who I was in the past. I don't even like this woman. I don't like whatever. So there's a risk there, of course. But there's mm-hmm. also some strength, in my opinion, and I don't have research to back it, that building your couple identity when your own personal identity is not completely solidified or formed yet can be an effective way to build oneness. That you learn more about yourself through the strength of your partner's identity, even as they're adjusting and growing, and can create what you often see for couples where the marriage does seem to boost somebody into another level of responsibility, accountability, growth, or determination, right? I mean, I started dating Angie and went from 2.1 to Mm 3.8 in a single semester. With all the academic power in our family, why did dating Angie make that happen? And was it directly resulting to her? She never said anything. She never got my case. She didn't even know I had bad grades. So what was different, right? The motivation. Oh, I'm dating this serious woman. I want to make sure she knows I'm smart, even if I'm struggling knowing I'm smart myself. Right? All those kind of, I knew I was smart, but I mean academically. Right? So all those kind of factors, I think there's some benefit benefit if you're aware, if you're discussing, if you're sharing, to finish some of your adulting, to use this terminology, identity formation with a positive spouse whom you love. Yeah, and I don't disagree. I guess I would take it, having been single so long, looking at, like, part of me would be like, well, did you have to depend on Angie to get kick your butt in the gear? Like, I didn't, didn't because she, she didn't even know. But I'm just saying. Yeah, that's so, the whole like, point. Just yeah. the dynamics, you're saying something, it wasn't ever spoken overtly, mm. but something kicked in for you. You wanted to, in a sense... And this is something we talk about too in marital therapy. You you guys had the same values and yet you weren't living out those values exactly. And so now you're in partnership and you're impressed by her, her commitment and seriousness to her academics. And in this case, she was already a teacher. So her commitment to her, her students and to her profession. Mm-hmm. And you knew that was in you. You just hadn't had the discipline yeah. or really the desire. But I guess my point is, some so I, okay to play devil's advocate in a way I'd be like well why can't people or wh- I, I would argue people should man up woman up mm-hmm. independently and then Absolutely. come to each other with that maturity <laughs> and those values in place yeah so, and that's not a unfair argument at all yeah but often these man up or woman up scenarios happen outside of a relationship, but still benefit the relationship. So maybe yeah. it's a professor, a teacher, a coach who gets in our face and challenges us to grow up or to move. Because at the exact same time I started dating Angie and, and all of a sudden switched my desire and discipline, at least academically, that was the same time period when Doc Ryder started challenging me about the same thing. Mm-hmm. And he was saying, you're first to every practice. You're the best leader on the floor all the time. You're always consistent. He goes, you're in my classes. I don't see that in the classroom. Be first to class. Sit in the front row. Read all the material. I read most of it anyway because I like to read. But he, he just made that quick, you know, it's not like mom and dad and Warren and others hadn't said stuff like that before right. to me. But for whatever reason, at this particular time, I can still remember where it happened. We were on a bus ride to Bethel, Indiana, and Doc called me up to the front and just had this man-to-man with me for like an hour and a half. And I didn't really want it. Not before games. I was really in my zone before games. I <laughs> right. I'm really focused in Bethel had a tremendous point guard I was going up against and it was very distracting. But I can remember that conversation with Doc more than I remember the game. And you know my memory with games is pretty spooky weird. I do not yeah. know how you remember every pass and every Yeah, shot. and couldn't couldn't remember an algebraic from formula to save my life. But anyway, so that's just the point again where so it culminated with more than just Angie, more but when those happen, how they happen, it's hard to read them. But I found when they happen within marital or future marital context, they tend to be pretty solidified. So I'm coming at it from my model. What I, when I was 
really working with women and so forth was to remind them that this extra time single is mm-hmm. an opportunity Absolutely. to develop that character, to develop those values, to really uh, develop that identity. And that doing that separate as an independent woman can be helpful because then, like we spoke to a moment ago, you know who you are, you know what's a good fit for you. I'm not saying you can't do it together, but at the same time, do you then have a tendency for more codependency? Yes, I agree. Do you have mm-hmm. the, the, the fear for me, having not lived that life, and again, trying to highlight the benefits of not having married young, not, though I would have liked to have married young. I mean, sure. I didn't expect to be 42, for heaven's sake. Figured out like late 20s at least, but goodness gracious, 42. It's <laughs> a long time. Anyway, but my point is, trying to highlight the benefits then is that I think people get married later. Maybe you're going to speak to this in a minute. I don't want to jump the, the gun, but that codependency, when I got married, I never expected Dan to make me happy. And I mm-hmm. see younger couples, because they haven't even really had adult life independently, they can, they could have the tendency, the possibility of looking to each other and going, well, I'm 32 now. We've been married 10 years and I'm just kind of feeling the blahs. And what what have you done for me lately? Not much. So mm-hmm. you're, my marriage isn't great and it's your fault because you're a cruddy husband. And expecting that that marriage is going to fulfill you and define you in a way that I think people who are single longer don't have that expectation. Yeah, and you know that I'm currently working with a couple that's older and getting ready to get married. And you and I and Angie and Dan hopefully are going down there to be all part of it. And I'm going to get to officiate it and you're going to get to sing. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, it's kind of one of our faithful followers over the years. I didn't ask her if I could say her name, so I won't say it yet, but we'd like to get her on in the, in the future. But one of the fun parts about working with them is they have firmly rooted personal individual identities. The challenge now is at this age, in the late 30s, early 40s age, to now how do we merge that? Where when you're 21, 22, 23, it just seems kind of natural and organic, merge on in. Now, on that same boat, the crisis couples I'm with that are in their 40s, married young, now divorce is staring them in the face or they're heading that way or it's going to happen. Doesn't matter how good of a therapist I am, I, I can't stop all the divorces. Sometimes I shouldn't. That's a weird feeling to be in as a pastor therapist, but the reality is sometimes they need to be apart. But what I hear often and see often is we got married young and one or the other partner just molds or shapes into what the other partner wants and loses themselves. And so then 10, 15, 20 years later, it's a crisis. Mm -hmm. It's an identity crisis that comes out in a marriage crisis. And so the fact that Angie and I struggled the first two, three, four years with a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, probably in the create a crisis theory I have about marriage, (laughs) saved the marriage because both of us are so stubborn and strong-willed, neither was backing down. I was going to be fully me, she was going to be fully her. We were trying to cater to each other once in a while, but it wasn't in the right reasons. It wasn't for symmetry and hope. It's just like, I don't feel like we're wrestling or fighting tonight or arguing, right? And so I'm glad we had all those tough struggles because then we had to formulate a different kind of identity and yet recognize we're both so stubborn. We're going to keep ourselves. We're going to still be us and we should be. I mean, I was still developing all my own mm-hmm. curriculum at that time and developing into my marital counseling work. You know, it's hard to be a, a good marital therapist when your own marriage isn't doing well. So I wasn't focusing on that. I was doing all my young guy stuff and the crisis kids stuff at that time. But I think that identity formation piece, I'm conceding to you in this one that it's probably wiser, easier, and better to marry late as far as pure identity. And so, for those couples that do get married young, and I say this all the time to my young couples, I got two of them I'm marrying here in the next three weeks, you got to work harder up front. Mm -hmm. You got to do a lot more awareness, understanding, you know, really figure each other out and understand and, and that instant need clarification and talk through things because you don't have the years of being in a profession and being in a career and being on your own to dance through all these things. And so, I just challenge them up front to do extra work Not that older couples don't need to, but you kind of know who you are and you kind of know what you're looking for better. I I don't know if you agree with that part of the concession from a late married position. Yeah, well, 
what was striking me when you were talking was that when I was single and seeing those younger couples married, there was a bit of me going, oh, you know, kind of wistfully thinking that'd be so nice to mm -hmm. always have your plus one and to not have to go to parties by yourself. And, and so to do a reframe on myself during that time, mm -hmm. I would reframe and go, you know what though, I'm gaining skills and gaining, um, I'm gaining strength and, and confidence, independence that I wouldn't have had if I'd partnered up, perhaps. I'm yeah. not saying that you and Angie aren't independent, but I, I mean, there are people who will tell me how independent they are and they got married at 22 and I'm like, I don't know if it's the same independence. Yeah, I think I it is different. Yeah. At least in certain contexts, it's different. Yeah, yeah, I'm, just, not, I'm not uh, discreet in that one. You just don't have that person. There comes a point when you're... Developmentally speaking, and most of us want to meet our person, and developmentally, developmentally speaking, also when you're a child, your parents focus on you, but you, but you get older and you, you become an adult and you go, yeah, but mom and dad have to put each other first because that's really the husband and wife is the top mm -hmm. of the hierarchy of the family. And then you see your siblings and they have their spouses and you're like, well, they have to put each other first. And you're like, who's putting me first? No yeah. one. <laughs> so then you have to just- put yourself. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. there's, I guess that's the piece that I would say, but I appreciate you conceding. But I also think- Not conceding the entire thing. Don't- Oh yeah, you are. I, I took it. I, I received I that. <laughs> yes, it was not the whole thing. It's just that part of the identity piece. Yeah, and it's not like you and Dan didn't still have adjustments and flexibility. Of course you do. You have to figure each other out now in the context and you moved into his home, right? So that's a whole nother adjustment flexibility flexibility that an early marriage likely doesn't have. Although oh, I, have, yeah. I have plenty of couples nowadays that the economy is so difficult and if they can't land the right jobs right away, they're, they're literally moving in with family that first year or two of marriage. And it's not recommended, of course, but... You know, I'm not going to not marry a couple because that's the reality of what they're having to go through. Mm -hmm. It's just, again, we got to recognize if that's happening, family systemic stuff is going to be a way bigger challenge. And your freedom and individuation to really be a, a unit, a couple partnership that makes their own decisions, their own calls, is going to be jeopardized a little bit until you can get yourself out. And that sounds car Until you can move on. <laughs> get yourself out. Sounds like they're in prison. Well, I mean, yeah. I don't, I, yeah, living with anyone's in-laws for marriage, first couple of years, because those are critical years, like you said, yeah. and especially perhaps even more critical when you're marrying young. When you're young, yeah. So the leave, cleave, oneness is going to be delayed and stagnated a bit by simply being with your family, even if your family's awesome, even if they're fantastic and super boundary aware. It still doesn't matter. You're you're still feeling like you're almost playing house right. in one of your family's buildings. Yeah. Well, so the identity piece, just to kind of put a pin in this one, I think it's really interesting because you're talking about essentially having an identity crisis together if you marry young. You're going Almost, to be yep. in your 20s. That's really your it's identity versus role confusion and that's then right. intimacy versus isolation. So let's bring Erickson into it. So he's the socio-emotional. He talks about these crises that we have at different stages. And so in adolescence, we're supposed to be working on our identity and role confusion, but we have asserted yeah. mm -hmm. that adolescence takes longer in this generation. And so that identity development, then he says, once you get your identity in place, then you look to intimacy versus isolation. So he would suggest get that identity formed and then you're prepared because you right. do have a strong sense of self to have a true intimate relationship. But if you are doing both of those developmental tasks and facing both of those crises at the same time, you're saying there may be extra challenges there on the front end for those who marry young. I think there will be. I don't think it's a maybe. Okay. And if you're aware and can get some good premarital work or something to prepare you for that, it can expedite a little bit of the speed towards a quicker oneness, but not necessarily because life has a lot of ups and downs anyway, no matter what. Mm -hmm. So one of the other positives that comes off of this identity piece mm -hmm. is that young ones tend to, young couples tend to build their functional structure together. And if you can do that well, and people might be surprised, I've said this a bunch of times on with crisis counseling and with preparatory marriage counseling, we talk a lot about functional reality in the home. It's not sexy, it's not, you know, it doesn't feel like I should be paying for this kind of stuff, but 
people tend to not pay attention to those things. What are our values in the house of cleanliness, order, timing, budget, all those kind of factors. And where I've seen older couples struggle a little bit with that because they've been doing their own thing for 15, 20 years. It's hard just to kind of go, ah, your way's better, let's do it. Where these young couples often barely have ever done any of their own finances or structures yet or lived on their own yet. And sometimes that can be an easier process to accommodate each other or figure out what standards we're going to have for functionality where older couples are tend to be a little stuck in their ways. In fact, some of my single buddies, I have several um, that I've grown old with as I've been married 35 years and they've been single 35 years post-college, post-high school. Several of them say part of the reason they don't pursue it at this age is simply because they're stuck in their ways and they don't mean that negatively. It's just the reality. They don't want to alter. They don't want to adjust. They like the way they do it. Yeah, but if you... You want love i think it's worth it oh i'm not saying i disagree i'm not saying i don't disagree i'm just saying that's one of their comments about mm -hmm. that but what do you think about that context of the young couples without a lot of life experience can actually build their functionality while they're wrestling through these identity pieces and everything else which can make it feel more together than maybe a couple who's been living on their own for 20 years as adults and then they got to merge yeah, that makes perfect sense. As you were speaking, I was thinking. So you concede of, immediately, and then that point's over. It is not over, and I'm not conceding immediately because I, I have I a caveat. I okay. do think that in general, yes, because you are again, you're so young, maybe just coming from a dorm or a couple years in an apartment with some roommates, probably. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about who's doing what job, chores, tasks. Like you said, are we picking up the house on a regular basis, or do yeah. we a deep do a deep clean every two new, two weeks? Any of that stuff. Yeah. And I think, especially now, if you're talking about someone who's been in, in the professional realm and they have these roles there, and then all of a sudden they have these domestic realities mm -hmm. that they didn't quite have because they weren't a couple. Again, maybe some roommates, maybe living by themselves. And so domestic realities, it's just me. And I do it. I pick up when I want and I don't when I yeah. don't. And so, yeah. And these rhythms, you like to talk about rhythms yeah. and cadence and flow and, and again, how, how social are we? Do we go out with other couples every mm -hmm. weekend? Do we not? Do, do we have uh, Netflix and chill nights? Is that on the regular? Or does one, one member of the, of the couple go, that's boring. I want to yeah. be out on the town. Exactly, yeah. All these kinds of things you could develop a, maybe easier together because you're still young people figuring that yeah. out for yourself. Yeah, you haven't formed it yourself yet. So now right. you just do it with someone else that you love and trust and want to build it with. And I just like in the premarital stage to make that obvious and cognizant rather than subconscious and in the background. Because just like we know how much environmental factors influence our peace, our joy, our happiness, our love, obviously they double up when you're in a marriage. And I'm all about all the things that seem too trivial or that's not a big deal to work itself out. No, bring it all out and <laughs> talk mm -hmm. about it. Because so much of the thing, so many of the things that you think aren't going to be a big deal can actually become a big deal if you haven't recognized them as part of your values. Again, I mean, I think we're like a broken record, but I don't even know if people don't even know that reference anymore, do they? Probably not. So back in the day when you had LPs, well, then <laughs> they're, they're doing vinyl again. <laughs> if you got a scratch in your record, it would keep repeating the same line over, over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> Tim needs to add some like kind of like background some sound, those, effects, <laughs> yeah. sound effects. Gen anyway, X sound effects. I know Gen X sound effects. Oh, that's a good name. Is that our band name? Maybe that's our band. That name. should be our name. <laughs> it's just siblings is gone. Now it's Gen, Gen X, X sound effects. Effect. I love it. <laughs> But that means, Tim, that means Tim can't join us to play guitar sometimes because he's not a Gen Xer. I know, but neither is Austin, and he plays with yeah, us. Yeah, we, so. we adopted him in. Yeah, into the Gen X. That's hmm. right. You have to come correct, though, if you want to be part of Gen X. There's some, uh, yeah, there's some initiation that's going to happen. No, not hazing. Good. Not hazing, people. Just initiation. Well, anyway. we, we had hazing, but yeah, they're not allowed we anymore. We did. Yeah. Well, we'd get canceled if we hazed now, but okay, I digress. So I'm thinking about someone who gets married later and now, especially let's say from a woman's perspective and she's been, she's been career woman cause she's had no choice. Maybe that was her goal, but maybe she mm -hmm. was like, well, I gotta be more career focused because I'm, I'm the only one paying my bills. And now she's in this domestic context and maybe her husband is hearkening back to his mother and how she had a hot meal on the mm -hmm. table for him every, uh, for the family every night. And his wife's coming home at like six, seven from a long day at the office. Those kinds of expectations, I think, could be more challenging 
for your, the older couples. Yeah, when they're rooted for 20 years or something already. Right. Right. And she's getting a, a lot of her identity, getting back to the identity, pulling that theme through because it's, we can talk about these distinct categories, but they all weave together. Her identity may be very wrapped up in her career. And maybe she's had people say things to her, well, you're a career woman. And so, you know, you probably won't get married because, I mean, women hear this. Oh, you put your mm -hmm. career over. No, I, women don't always do that. Right. Women oftentimes become very, uh, derive a lot of identity and pleasure from their career if the love thing isn't working out for them. And mm -hmm. when the love thing works out, then they're perfectly willing to not have as much energy toward their career. Yeah. So these are things that, again, in premarital, someone could talk about that. Like, are you willing and interested in kind of moving into that more domestic role that you haven't had the chance to do? Or is that something you've never been interested in? I mean, those are good conversations to have, whether with someone in premarital or just as a couple. Like for Dan, I mean, we're, we're really traditional, even though I didn't look very traditional when I was living single and mm -hmm. getting my doctorate. I looked like a very, here I am a professor with my doctorate, and it looked more that career girl track. But I did that and I loved it. But at the same time, it was never, oh, I don't want that. And I'm putting that over mm -hmm. trying to find love. Trying to find love was always a priority. Always the priority. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'm not going to sit there and just be like, well, I guess I'll just do nothing and be miserable <laughs> until right, love right. comes my way. So I guess when, when I got married to Dan and I had the opportunity now to flex those more domestic muscles and get more into all the home ec training mom had given us or me, I guess, more so than you. But I was happy and ready to do that. And, and letting go of that career identity to a degree wasn't threatening to me. I was like, cool, been there, done that. Now I'm happy and excited to be able to do this other thing that I haven't been able to nurture, the side of no. wanting to cook and to keep a house nice and decorate it and all that kind of stuff for my husband, like definitely with the intention of <coughs> to make his home feel like a home yeah, and have and that woman. That's touch. where that identity and traditional values and alignments for you and Dan worked really, really well. Right. But I've certainly worked with many couples who marry late where that's not working quite as well. Like one partner expects the other to stop their career or stop something that they don't want to stop yet. And so now it's like, gosh, do I just give all that up for a new person I love a lot, but I've done this for 20 years. How do I just change that out? How do I just switch that out? And so again, I think one of the mistakes young couples make, older couples make also, um, sacrificing too much of yourself simply to make your spouse happy is a dangerous proposition. Automatic sacrifice in personality, temperament, desire, wants happens in marriage anyway to build oneness. But like pretending like you would like not want to do research anymore or wouldn't want to write anymore, or wouldn't want to teach ever anymore, simply because you have this good man now that enjoys your domestic side, that would have been too much. That would have been beyond normal. For And that's something Angie and I wrestled through at the young side, that it took her a while to realize sports were always going to be part of my life in some capacity <laughs> and to know what that looked like. Because for a while, it was like, I really wanted to be a head coach for my whole career. Right. And even started to pursue that in graduate work. And then I didn't feel quite as sure, but she wasn't as sure. And so I was trying to figure that out young. Now, if I'd already been coaching 20 years and then we got married, that's a different, you know, she's like, well, he's, that's his job. He's a head coach somewhere. Right. So it's a whole different element of how you sacrifice, how you choose, how you meld that together. And this next one, my last one that I wanted to bring up, at least for this first episode is really one that's not fair to the older couple because it's nothing they can do to alter it to, as far as the adjustment. But it's that idea that you not only grow with your partner in a longevity style, but you can connect with the in-laws and the extended family and the friendship group developmentally as a rite of passage to keep moving forward. So, meeting your spouses, your future spouse's best friends when they're also 19, 20, 21, 22 is a lot different than meeting them at 40, 41, 42. It doesn't mean the relationship can't grow and still be positive, but if you grow up together with the same kids and the same, and you see your in-laws and your you know nephews and nieces, it's just a little different. It, it's not anything an, an older married couple can do anything about other than assimilate and accommodate into the family system as fast as you can. But there's some benefit to that, the long-term effect. What do you mean like you basically because Brock's so much younger than Angie, like you're almost like a big brother to him or that's, that's like, one context that, that works. Or, 
Well, just in general. So, you know, I know I've known my mother-in-law and father-in-law now since they were in their 40s. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than getting married at 40 and meeting them in their 60s. Right. So I'm just saying there's a longevity effect of the relational connections with best friends, with community groups, all of it, that just gives a certain deeper rootedness that, again, I don't think it's anything an older couple can do with other than jump in and, and immerse. Yeah, I just don't know if that's better or worse, really. I mean, I don't mean that worse, but I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't, how do you, how are you framing that as something that's a, a net positive for Well, I mean, I have, couples. you know, I had a wonderful father myself, and then I got a second father that was so different, mm -hmm. right? Completely different, but same strong values, strong man of faith, mm -hmm. strong man of God, loved his wife well, loved his kids well, just a totally different guy. And so I got the benefit of that as I'm forming my own identity and movement. I see this style of a godly father now, and I have a second father earlier. Dan's dad's awesome too, but you didn't need a whole lot of parenting from him by the time you got married, or yeah, you still enjoy being a daughter to him, but it's not quite the same as the formation years, getting that at 21, 22, 23. Again, that's why I'm saying it's nothing you can do at a late marriage stage other than jump in and enjoy everything you got while you got it. Mm -hmm. But I think there is some benefit to those long-term relationships. It's also a little harder at times because when you're 21, you really think something like going with your friends and watching, you know, 16 games during March Madness is better than you're spending time with your wife at her birthday or something, right? I didn't do that because Angie's birthday is not in March, but I'm, I'm saying we, we think there in that context Lucky sometimes. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> you think sometimes in that context that, but I got to hang out with my friends here, right? And so, by the time you're 35, you're like, well, I can do part of that there and part of this here, and I'm just more willing to flex and adjust. So that's why it's an abstract one, Karen. I, I couldn't yeah. even, I didn't even know how to qualify. I don't it when even I was know how to write it, it down. I'm writing down all these. Yeah, but. I wrote them down and I can send them to you later. But so I'm not saying that's a negative for the older couple, like something that's going to cost them per se. But I think there can be. You, I think you framed it this way. It can be some benefit, but if those relationships with the in-laws and the other friends, it's terrible, right. that adds a whole other layer of three and a half decades of pain <laughs> rather than well, the I, blessing. Again, I'm trying to just personalize this just because that's the easiest touchstone, obviously, is our own experience. I probably would have felt that to a degree if our father hadn't been such a huge presence in our lives. Mm -hmm. Like meeting Max later, like for example, uh, Dan's younger brother, his wife never had a close relationship with her father at all. Like just never, like basically no relationship. So Max has been her dad. Of course. And yeah. they, you know, Possibly. they got married like mid late twenties. So okay. early, early, yeah. early, yeah. yeah. Early but yeah. Max has been her dad. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful healing and restoration mm -hmm. for her to have. Cause Max is like a dad. Like he's yeah, such absolutely. a, yeah. Such yeah. a great fatherly figure, strong, mm -hmm. protective provider, very like I love you and hugs and just mm -hmm. got some Bob energy really to Absolutely. Him, yeah, you know, very I similar guess. in that masculine well, energy. Certainly the yeah, the similar context really. Mm -hmm. And I love that for her. Did I need that? Not the same at all. Because mm -hmm. even when dad passed away, and even though Dan and I met and, and dad was sick, I mean I was still like the formative foundational mm -hmm. fathering had been done in spades and then some. Yeah. And so I but I see what you're saying for couples who that in-law and those friendship groups can really be restorative mm -hmm. to whatever maybe was lacking in their family of origin. That would be, there would be some, it would be poignant, uh, some bittersweet there. Like, I'm glad I have this now, but gosh, I could have used this at 25 yeah. or yeah. 35 even. Yeah. So some generational yeah. longevity, community connections that can be holistically a big part of health and growth. Now, I, I'm doing a complete disservice to my crisis counseling side if I don't say that those also can literally destroy a marriage. And there's other guests we'll have on in the future in the summer where the in-law relationships and the friend relationships actually okay, that's cause what great consternation in the marriage. So, it doesn't mean it's an automatic positive, but it's the opportunity for that holistic mm -hmm. measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure you were clarifying. Like, you're talking about these exec... The, again, the in, the in law and the external close friends, yeah, that network can be in some cases a real detriment. Yeah, and it's it, and we talk about that in premarital as well, and we do that in the whole power quotient thing that I've developed right about 
how are we determining how much time we spend with these friends and the family and what does that look like and what's the boundaries and what's positive, what's negative. Just to be honest and upfront and open so especially the younger couples can face it sometimes for the first time. Mm -hmm. So that's all crucial. Well, I think that's a wrap, but I have more research. So okay. I do think this is going to be a part one. That's okay. I have. I didn't even get to my whole list. I just had some. You didn't? Mm, those are just right. three. I had like seven. You had seven. Okay, so just... We kind of talked, I just want to just, this is the professor and me, as we land the plane, so mm -hmm. to speak, I want to recap. We started out with just a maturity, an emotional mm -hmm. a readiness and a willingness, eagerness, not that all this adulting is going to be, uh, I got to do this because I'm getting yeah. married, but I'm, I'm ready for this. I want to do this. I want to step into this part of my personality and identity, which then led to identity as number. So, so we have some key components that we can grapple with that, like you said, could be pros and cons mm -hmm. on either end of the spectrum, early or late marriage. But we're talking about identity. So one is the maturity in general, then identity, then building your functional structure together might be easier for early married folks. And then you also brought up the in-laws and the extended uh, social network. And that could be, again, a pro and a con based on anyone's family of origin and their, what they're bringing to the marriage as far as their social context. Yeah. And I think our listeners heard it, but we're gonna, I'm going to affirm it one more time. We are 1000% pro-marriage. So whenever our listeners are in a marriage or getting to or wanting to or engaged or become married, we support it. We just want people to recognize different sides of each time frame. Yeah. And I think it's just important to think about the different challenges. There's challenges yeah. early or late. And we can have some fun kind of playing. Uh, yeah, I'll end with happy. this, that historically, throughout the world history, I win. Because people died at age 38. <laughs> but, so, they yes. got, but they got married so much earlier. So because I, I get the historical. <laughs> I, know, I, just, I thought I'd get you worked up right before we leave. <laughs> <That'd> be <good. laughs> That's right. You are correct in that, though. Yeah, I know. I got that one little one in the back, back pocket when I needed mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. I really didn't need to trump it right there because you were not. I wasn't really coming I thought hard. it was just the fun way to finish it up. Yeah, that's good because I've got more stats for next time and that's that's what I'm going to really come <laughs> That's what you'll lead with. Yeah. All right, up. I'll bless it out. Yep, Lord, right. thank you for the gift of marriage no matter how old we are when we find that right person. And uh, Lord, your word says clearly that you ordained marriage. You created it as a reflection of your love for the church. And Lord, you say, uh, you, your son said himself in Matthew 19 that what you have brought together let no one put asunder. And Lord, so there is a clear distinction from you that you even select and ordain and appoint particular people to get married. And uh, Father, we just celebrate that in you and with you and through you. And Lord, whether people listening today are in the premarital stage or they're single stage or they've been married a little bit or married a lot, whether they're young, middle, or old, uh, bless their partnerships, bless their communication, bless their awareness, help them to recognize the truth of maturity and sacrifice, accommodation, flexibility, to recognize their own individual and the couple identity, to recognize the importance of uh, not only the values together, Lord, but the functional uh, capabilities and processes that are so important in home and marriage environment. And then the extended uh, family and in-laws. And uh, Lord, you bring two trees together, uh, not just the two apples, but the two whole family trees. And, and may those relationships and the extended family and friends and social groups be a tremendous blessing with appropriate boundaries and individuation and separation, but also unity in the spirit and in love. So we thank you for this time, Lord, and uh, pray this would be a blessing to all those who hear. Amen.